She's the evil ass bitch. She killed her mom too. <laughs> she totally killed her mom. <laughs> yes. Killed her mom. <laughs> Greetings, Audio Avengers. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, your headquarters for insightful and entertaining discussions of Marvel television. One year ago today, we began our wild ride through the MCU's TV adventures with the premiere of WandaVision, a pair of episodes that left us all delighted, confused, and desperate for more. Think of how much has happened since then on the TV shows alone. Monica Rambeau, Wanda's kids, Eli Bradley, Kang, Sylvie, Kingpin, a new Captain America, Alligator Loki, Kate Bishop, Bucky and Sam's sister I fucking each other, and it all began on January 15th, 2021. So we're going to celebrate the one-year anniversary of WandaVision with a look back at the series on a special episode of the MTVC. We'll discuss what holds up, what missed the mark, the ethical and moral questions that hang over the series, what might be ahead for our favorite super witch, and so much more. I'm your multi-hyphenate, host, producer, editor, social media maven, and more, Mark Folletti. I'm joined by two of the MTVC's biggest WandaVision stands, Christine Kippens and Maeve Adams. Welcome, y'all. Hello. Hello, everyone. I am, am so excited to talk about this. I like can hardly contain myself. <laughs> yeah, Maeve, you actually teach WandaVision in a class, right? Is What I is do. that class? Yeah. So it's my uh, English 262, Gender and Literature. Uh, it's one of my favorite classes to teach because it's a course that lots of different students take. A lot of engineering students, business majors, liberal arts majors, education majors, all kinds of folks come into that class. And we do everything from fairy tales to Rosemary's Baby. And as of last semester, I started incorporating WandaVision because I think it's a really brilliant contemplation of a lot of themes that we think about in that class in terms of gender and patriarchy and misogyny and its consequences in the world. Christine, did they teach cool shit like WandaVision when you were in college? I do not recall that shit. Not at all. Um, <laughs> we didn't have cool shit like that whatsoever. And then, of course, after I graduated from law school, there's like a criminal justice course based on the wire. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go back to law school. What the hell? Yeah, no, all types of cool shit happen after we graduate. I mean, we didn't even have an escalator on Penn's campus. <laughs> before I graduated. And then as soon as I graduated, they fucking built one in the Huntsman building. And I'm so pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Escalators take up so much space. You know, I can see kind of why they didn't have it before. But also, you got to get your steps in, right? We've learned now yeah. everybody has to walk yeah. more. So steps I mean, are also, it's it's an old ass campus. It's the yeah. country's oldest university. So there you go. That's very no exciting. escalators back in the 1700s <laughs> when Benjamin Franklin was walking around the place. <laughs> Pity. All right. We've got two parts to this discussion today. We're going to look at the big picture of the show, WandaVision, what we loved, its themes and all that stuff. And then we will turn to some character based discussion. Think of it as a story cast and character cast mashup, if you will. <laughs> so let's start with that big picture. Now, Maeve, a year later, when you think about WandaVision, what do you think of first? What stuck with you the most? Something specific? Well, this is tough for me because I don't like questions like this because I always feel like I'm being judged by the question. Like, did you think of really the best thing or is it kind of the best thing? So I'm just going to go with the first thing that came to my mind when I thought about this question. And that is the conversation between Vision and what I was calling in StoryCast Alterna Vision, the vision that is sent in by Hayward to destroy uh, mm -hmm. our vision. And the conversation that they have about the ship of Theseus, which I think might seem like a bit of a, I don't know, pedantic kind of nerdy moment in the show, but stuck with me for a couple of reasons. One, because it's a really important philosophical thought experiment that I love I love to teach and I love to think about. Also because it, when we talked about it in StoryCast, we primarily talked about questions of identity and responsibility because we were kind of all, all about, you know, thinking about Wanda, Wanda's responsibility and, and the relationship between her trauma and her responsibility. 
But I want to rethink that a little bit because I rewatched that scene again last semester, obviously, when I was watching the whole thing with my students. And I rewatched it again this weekend because it, you know, keeps kind of, you know, when you, you, you like see something or read something and it kind of niggles at you, you're like, I mm-hmm. haven't totally figured it out, you know? Um, and I kind of want to be a little more literal about it, I think, because Vision says to Alternative Vision, he describes the thought experiment and he says, you know, if you've got a ship and it's full of rotting wood and then you replace all the planks, is it the same ship? And I think that there's another way of reading that scene that has to do with the show's concerns with trauma and the way that specifically in kind of modern American society, we think about trauma as something like, oh, traumatized, you got to fix yourself, you're broken, let's repair you so that you can start your life again and become a different person. But like a lot of trauma theorists think about this really differently, like you, you're you traumatized and if you're traumatized by something, there's no kind of turning yourself into something new, those things don't go away. So in other words, the broken parts are a part of you and you have to kind of learn how to live with them rather than imagining some way of kind of like, you know, as it were, clearing the decks to use a seafaring metaphor. Um, and so I think that that, that that scene sticks with me because even though it feels kind of like pedantic and nerdy and sort of a, a sort of singular moment in the show, I think it's really asking us to reflect back on everything we've been thinking about so far with respect to Wanda and her trauma. Well, I can safely say I didn't think of it that way. So that's that's very interesting. Did you have any recollections of the ship of Theseus scene, Christine, after a year? Did that stick with you at all? Oh, it definitely does. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful scene. And it I often have recall to it because of how how so visiony it was. <laughs> <laughs> this moment of just like, by the way, we have been fighting toe to toe. For so long, let's have a logic fight. And it was, it, that's how computers fight. Of course, it makes total sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that scene. I, I remember talking about it for a really long time. It's not the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of WandaVision. What does? To be quite honest with y'all, the first thing that comes to mind whenever I think of WandaVision are mm. the memes. <laughs> This show was so fucking memeable. Twitter was alive every day, anytime a WandaVision episode dropped. And the images and the gifs were just so perfect. We were coming on to a year of dealing with COVID, almost a year, well, over a year of dealing with COVID, almost a year of being in quarantine in the United States. Most of us started in March of that year, um, of the year before. And we were all in mourning. We were all Mm -hmm. grieving. I mean, so many lives lost, our freedom lost, our way of life lost. We were grieving all of those things. Um, And so to have this show that you could connect to about grief and then (laughs) use images and moments in a really funny way on the internet was so therapeutic. I mean, I used Agnes winking and like doing <laughs> her little shoulder at the gate and <laughs> walking off so many times. The um the meme of Wanda sitting there during the Modern Family episode where she's like, mm-hmm. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. That was the meme of this whole fucking COVID experience. Like, yeah, I'm fine. Kind of. No, not really. Don't ask me how I'm doing. I'm going to say I'm fine, but I'm not. (laughs) And of course, the pinnacle of 2021 culture, the vision meme of (laughs) vision in a do-rag and a gold chain from the finale episode, Black Twitter Nailed it. It was awesome. <laughs> and Vision sticks with me to this very day. So the show, fantastic. A masterpiece. I cry every fucking time I watched it. I binge watched it from start to finish yesterday and sobbed my whole fucking head off all over again. This show is perfection. And yet it's the memes <laughs> that I will carry on with me forever. They're so good. 
It's funny, too, because they call their shot with that. There's that moment in that episode, in the Modern Family episode, episode seven, where uh, Wanda does the point like the woman in the cat at di- at the dinner table meme. And then Monica mm, does yeah. the like cat at the dinner table meme face like that is a super intentional call out to that meme, which was especially huge back at that time. So they were definitely like intentionally thoughtful about memes. Um, Christine, do you know what I'm going to answer this question with? <laughs> oh, of course. We. I'm sorry we didn't kick off the whole show with you. <laughs> And they're not being a fucking Mephesto in this story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised I haven't changed this to like the Mephisto TV club. Um, but uh, no, look, I, I definitely think about the endless theory casting because it felt like mm. the first time since the beginning of True Detective season one, where most people I know got caught up in mm. a- analyzing every frame, every phrase of a TV show. It was like Lost or some of those other shows which really got people invested in trying to parse all the details. Remember when Monica said aerospace engineer and for a week, the entire internet was like, Reed Richards, Reed Richards. Oh my God, they're going to do Reed Richards just because, you know, Fantastic Four has a scientist at the center of it. So I just remember that and how, how... Toxic that actually became by the end of the show when all the things Mm. that people didn't get uh, became something that caused them to take a while to appreciate what the show actually was. So, you know, there's a there's a little bit of a, you know, a sharp edge to that one for me, because I think it it did teach us, though, that that Marvel shows are going to tell us what they are by the middle of like episode four or five. Monica's basically spelled it out. It's all Wanda. It's her grief. She lays all of that out to the sword folks. And so I think sometimes when a character we're supposed to trust is telling us what's going on, maybe stop theorizing about evil devil gods. That said, they really (laughs) did tease us with a lot of that shit. And we might talk about that a little bit later. I do like the fact, though, that like it says something about the tolerance of modern television audiences for complexity, right? That we tend Mm. to sort of, you know, deride our fellow, you know, modern humans by saying that, you know, we don't, we, we, we all prefer reality television. We all prefer being kind of hit on the head with what a TV show is about rather than sort of really actually appreciating or enjoying the, the detective hunt of trying to figure out what something really means you know, that we are actually all kind of native critical thinkers and we enjoy being forced to think critically about what something is or, you know, what it means or what it's really referring to or whatever. I think there's a, there's maybe something a little hopeful in there about, you know, modern humans. I feel like folks really love a puzzle. I know yeah. I do. And it's honestly one of the things that connected me to the A Song of Ice and Fire series. For those of you who don't know, it's the book series um, that Game of Thrones is based on because there are so many clues in the writing of the book that it becomes like <laughs> a detective mystery for the reader to figure out like who's actually related to who and what's going to happen and what is this foreshadowing and it's part of the fun so much so that people have annual conventions when there's no <laughs> pandemic going on to like figure out the puzzle together <laughs> i Love how optimistic you guys are about this quality, whereas I would just take us straight down the QAnon path and be like, look what you have wrought uh, with your theory casting world. Mark, Uh, it's the beginning of 2022. We all need to be a little hopeful. Yeah, you're right. Let's be positive. We're complex and passionate fans, and it's Mm. all good energy. (laughs) Um, So let's take that energy forward. Christine, overall, as you look back, as you do a rewatch all in one sitting, What do you think this show was ultimately about? And is that a compelling idea or theme when you reflect on whatever you think this show was about? Yeah, so in keeping with the theme of bringing positive energy (laughs) forward, for me, this show is really about processing grief. (laughs) So (laughs) sorry to bring us down, folks. Nope, nope, love it. Oh no. Yes. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, and I feel like this is, this is the hitting, the hitting you over the head a little bit, but you, you didn't know that going into it. I mean, that first episode is so magical where you're just like, what the 
fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> Why am I on, on like the Donna Reed show? This is this is bizarre. Um but beautifully done. The acting is masterful and it continues and you're just like what could this possibly be? And then slowly but surely as reality starts forcing its way in as those of us who like to avoid <laughs> our feelings are get so annoyed by and so you know disarmed by reality kind of creeping in and forcing you to face shit you start to realize that this show is about Wanda's pain and how she is not processing it and the effects that that can have not only on yourself but on the closest people to you and your community like yeah. pain isn't felt just by the individual the people who care about you hurt as well you know as they say hurt people hurt people right so you can inflict that pain that trauma onto others even though you don't mean to Everyone in the town is talking about when I sleep, I have your nightmares. And it's an incredibly powerful statement that, you know, Wanda, even though she tries to gaslight these people, because it's too difficult for her to, to face the truth herself, they're not okay because she's not okay. And she cannot admit to herself that she's not okay. And that is something that I can identify with very, very strongly. You want to be strong. You're perceived as strong. You can't possibly let anyone know that there's a crack in the foundation. Mm -hmm. And in that denial of reality breeds the beginning of destruction. And that's exactly what this show told us. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I also thought it was well-timed. Like I said, after a year of being in quarantine and all of us being in mourning, it was a show that you could emotionally connect to. And one of the most powerful emotions is grief. So for us to go on this journey with Wanda, we got to grieve ourselves. It was a beautiful release. And I can't thank Marvel enough for putting this together because two years into this nonsense now revisiting the show is like therapy for me. Yo, we're yeah. not done with our grieving, you know, that's so, and <laughs> no, I think you're right. Like there's not wear masks, people <laughs> <laughs> get vaccinated for God's get sake. Vaccinated. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's striking the way that you have framed this because, you know, when, when we say things like hurt people, hurt people, we often think about that in terms of people in pain doing damage to other people by actually going out and hurting them. And obviously Wanda, you know, we think about it in terms of abuse, right? Like abusers ultimately abuse um, because they've been abused. And here, this is a, this, this is a sort of a trickier form of that because she's trying to make something beautiful. She's trying to make something good in the world. And part of it, the problem is that she's just repressing. She's sublimating all of her pain. And we know since Freud that that is deeply dangerous and deeply destructive. <laughs> and as we sort of think about how we go out back out into the world, right, as we sort of make our way back into our relationships with others, we need to think about how we're going to handle our pain, we can't just pretend it's not there. We can't pretend that like, oh, yay, now that we're all vaccinated and, oh, you know, someday in the near future, we've got herd immunity going on or something allows us to move right. back into our a version of our lives. We can't just pretend that none of this happened because it did. And we could do real damage by not confronting and grappling with that pain collectively and individually. I also think that the first episode speaks to what you're talking about, Christine, because we were so hungry for our own escape. And that first weird, delightful yeah. 1950s episode was like candy, death, yeah. you know, emotional mm -hmm. candy. And put, you know, at least for me as, as someone watching, put me in the same mindset as Wanda about sort of being able to sort of pretend all of this isn't happening. And, and that's why I think I was so obsessed with the show from the get go and probably why the Marvelous TV Club even exists ultimately, because... It was the ultimate escape, but you can only run for so long. <laughs> 
And it's a creepy escape, right? We got the, in that very first episode, we've got his boss and his wife asking for this to stop. And all, when we're watching that, we're all like, something is wrong here. Right. Right. And we kind of let it go because then the next episode goes somewhere else. And we kind of let those creepy moments in that episode go. And yeah, it's a, it's, it was a, it was a really profound moment in television for that year. And honestly, it still remains one of my favorite TV shows uh, because it just, it just spun us around in this really exciting way. How bad can it be when there's a lobster knocker on your door, you know? <laughs> no, no, I think, you know, there's so much to take away from that. Maeve, what did you see as the theme of the show itself as you look back on it a year later and having taught it now? Well, when I taught it, um, I taught it right after Rosemary's Baby because I felt like these two shows spoke to one another with respect to conceptions of domesticity. But doing that also made me look at WandaVision in a way that I hadn't the first time around. I thought about this show as kind of a tragic comedy or a comedy and a tragedy the first time I watched it, right? Because it's not quite tragic comedy, but it is comedy and tragedy. But watching it after watching Rosemary's Baby with students really persuaded me that this is a horror story and hmm. participates in a lot of the kind of conventions of really good horror stories that begin with scenes that look like kind of normal life or normal things that normal people do. People go and take vacations at hotels so that they can get some writing done with their family around. Uh, people go and look for apartments with their partners and they have dreams of making families together, a family together. Um, people doing kind of ordinary things. And then in a somewhere in Act 2, at the beginning of Act 2, middle of Act 2, in a, in a story like this, all of a sudden it becomes apparent that this, this, isn't, this, this isn't the normal that we thought it was. But the revelation about the fact that it's not normal, right? So here in WandaVision, Act 2, if we take the entire show as kind of one story, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in Episode 5, uh, Vision uh, kind of de whammies Norm, right? right. Uh, in that office scene where Norm explains to him what's going on, right? That she has sort of taken over their minds. And we all realize that all this stuff that we've kind of just taken as kind of fairly lighthearted and maybe a little weird is in fact truly horrifying. And the, similarly in a film like Rosemary's Baby, right? Like they're looking for a house. Things are getting kind of a little, you know, an apartment. They finally find their apartment. They meet these weird neighbors. But things are only kind of weird. And then she gets raped by the devil, right? Sorry, spoiler alert. But that, to the, what, the <laughs> I mean, it's you know, after the fact, whatever. Um, but, the, but what's interesting in, in these two, in, in this particular form that the horror story has taken, I think in some of its best forms, is that there's something recursive about that experience, right? So you, you watch all the way up until that moment, and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I should have known that this was coming. But the thing that you reflect back on is all this normal shit, Right. A mm. husband and a wife looking for an apartment, thinking about having a baby, right? A woman trying to make a home with her husband in a small, in small suburban America, right? But it turns out that those things are actually really deeply troubling aspects of modern culture. In, in both of these contexts, it's domesticity and women's roles and patriarchy in both, in both of these cases. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's, that, that's something that, simply because of the format itself, because we get to that revelation, we have to look back on all these things that we thought were normal. It forces us to reckon with the possibility that those things are horrifying too. I would pitch like sort of tying these two themes together as mm. hiding from our darkness and pain creates our own nightmare, right? That this idea mm -hmm. of not processing the grief is what creates the actual ongoing horror the ongoing terror, you know, because even Agatha, I think about how surprised Agatha was in that first moment when she realized that she was stealing the energy from the other witches in her coven in 1693 when she's on the stake. It didn't look like it was intentional, right? She clearly mm -hmm. looked shocked as her dark energy started killing those, those other women. And I think that maybe that she had let a different kind of darkness take root in her without really staring it down and seeing it for what it was, and it corrupted her and took her to the place that she is now as a microcosm for, for the bad version of what happens to Wanda if she 
continues down this path to become fully corrupted and in service of her own ends and running from, you know, her humanity, basically, which I feel like is what Agatha has been doing for a couple 300 years or so. So there's there's a lot lot to unpack there, I, you know, because I do think Wanda has been doing this her whole life. You yeah. know, it didn't start with the loss of vision and coming back after the blip. She basically never processed Pietro's death, right? Even in the flashback to her and Vision in the Avengers compound, right? She doesn't want to talk about it. She talks about how not talking about or talking about it won't make her feel better. And then after her parents died, her reaction was functionally to join a terrorist organization and radicalize herself with a bunch of real corrupt assholes. And that also probably didn't really help her get on the other side of her parents' death in any real meaningful way. So it feels like a Wanda, for the first time at the end of this show, is maybe approaching things a little more healthily. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would say to that is that there are powers that are outside of Wanda's control that are also conditioning her experience of this pain. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in, in her backstory, right, it's American imperialism that is also creating the problems that she's mm -hmm. fun fundamentally dealing with. And in 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 her constructed universe in New Jersey, it's also patriarchy, right? So there, there are these, there, there's on the one hand, a kind of personal problem. She's having a hard time kind of reckoning with her grief and that causes all this pain to others. But then there's this compounding problem of the world outside of her and the way that the conditions of something like imp American imperialism or the conditions of patriarchy in modern American society ultimately compound and exacerbate the any other kinds of psychological complexity that you're dealing with um if if you know if if we're we're seeing you know psychological complexity as causing problems and i think in the, in this case it is right but i think it it does matter that there are these kind of external circumstances um that are at, way outside of her control but even thanos was outside of her control killing vision and everything that yeah. she's sort of reckoning with all the grief is caused by forces outside of her control. You know, I think that yeah. continues to be part of the sort of broader challenge and, and why we're sympathetic to her in the end, I think, right? Because it's always, you know, these these massive forces. So, so Maeve, you made a really good point about it being a horror story from the very beginning. Mm. That even though everything looks ideal, there's still this undercurrent of patriarchy and sexism and gender roles and all of that. Um, so one of the, the themes that I took away from the show was that it was kind of a study on and a celebration of, of course, the American sitcom, but how the American sitcom portrays the ideal American family. Hmm. And yeah. in the beginning, you know, you've got, you have to be married, you know, <laughs> where's the ring? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the family unit does not, is not perfect unless there's a marriage um, and everything is swept under the rug. We have no idea what this calendar date means. We're not going to be honest about the fact that we don't know what the calendar date means. We're going to talk around it, just as we're going to talk around this sexist pig at dinner and just like keep playing our roles. But as the show progresses and as time progressed and as the sitcom progressed, the portrayal of the ideal American family changes. Mm -hmm. It becomes more flawed. We're able to embrace yeah. our mm -hmm. flaws and demonstrate them and become more honest about where we are as a society. What do we consider a family? You know, the neighbors start being part of the credits and are brought into the family and Wanda is just letting her magic powers fly in front of Agnes and the family unit grows. Um, and we've done that as a society. And we've done that through television in portraying that. And I loved the progression that um, the show made with that. But you're right. There's always this underlying systemic problem that we have as a society, multiple ones, that we mask. But we are slowly confronting each of them and honestly in that truth becoming stronger 
just as Wanda was, as as she refuses to acknowledge things, she's weaker. But the more and more she becomes more honest and is forced to realize what she has done and what's going on, she actually increases in power. Yeah. I like I like the attention that you're giving to the way that she's using her magic as the as the show progresses because I hadn't thought about it that way that in the beginning she uses her magic to construct an image of a perfect family with a woman who uses her magic to make dinner right and then right. as we sort of move on she more explicitly uses magic to serve the ends that she very much wants to serve of sort of building a world that 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 satisfies her that makes her happy even even if it's fucked up and you know and we can talk about that you know there's obviously this whole problem in the show of like grappling with Wanda's crime and you know that that's a separate issue though but what you're saying about like how the conception of the family and Wanda's role in it and Wanda's powers in the world progresses is really striking and i hadn't i hadn't thought about it that way before well, in context of all of this theme and the series itself, let's drill in a little bit more to the episodes themselves, Maeve. What was the best episode of the series? You know, I kind of want to say episode three. This is a really hard question for me because I loved so much of this series. But episode three is kind of amazing because it's the episode where Wanda gets pregnant and gives birth. And it's this sort of crazy consolidation of the role that women play in their lives in the family. And uh, in part because I, I, that doctor character is amazing. He's such an idiot. <laughs> you know, that whole like, I like to explain uh, to uh, pregnant women the growth of their babies in terms of fruit, right? As if they're just too stupid to really understand. And, and of course, this is set in, in, in contrast to Wanda's extraordinary powers, right? She's constructing this whole thing, right? She's like given birth to an entire community. And meanwhile, he's explaining her baby's growth in terms of the sizes of different kinds of fruit. So that, that episode really struck me because it kind of consolidates in one space a meditation on the way that we think about motherhood as if it's this thing that is the most important thing that fulfills women's lives. Whereas Wanda is obviously trying to build this whole, this entire universe for herself, that that's the thing that's going to fulfill her life, is building this universe in which she is safe and she can have a life with vision. And so it's this, it's the kind of perfect counterpoint to that really simplified understanding of what women's, women's jobs are in the world and what makes them happy. Another amazing thing about that episode is the ending, right? This is where mm. we get Geraldine becoming really more of a Monica and then saying the Ultron stuff so we know that there's something different about her. And then she gets booted all the way out and we get our first glimpse of the outside world at the very end of the episode. So it it's a banger at the end. It also has a bunch of great physical comedy with all of the Wanda trying to hide the pregnancy thing. Yeah. It really messed with me on the Mephisto front with that stork <laughs> walking around and disappearing in the red puff. That's also where we get the meme you were talking about, Christine, with the Agatha wink and Herb yeah. like, you know, drilling through the wall, which was so unsettling. There's just a ton going on in that episode. It also is where we get the... I think it's where it turns color first, right? Isn't it? It is. It's called Now right? in Color. That now would be color. its episode yeah. title. Yeah. 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 Some Brady Bunch shit, which is really yeah. great. Christine, do you have a favorite episode of the series? Before I answer this question, I would just like to state for the record that, you know, Hayward called Wanda a terrorist. Mm. He's wrong. You are the terrorist, Mark Filetti, for asking us this <laughs> impossible question. It is so brutal. So it good. is the worst question you have ever asked me ever on the Marvelous TV Club. It's so fucking hard. Like, as I was rewatching, I was literally writing like, this is the best episode. This is the best episode. No, no, yeah. this is the best episode. It's just, it's impossible. But it's so interesting, Maeve, when you started talking about how this is a horror show. Mm. It was the moment where it obviously became a horror show for the rest of us is my favorite episode and that's episode six all new halloween spooktacular which was the <laughs> 90s malcolm in the middle episode so much happens in this episode it is wild it is a 
to me, a perfect blend of the kooky and the MCU, right? Which was exactly what I needed. Because by episode four, the novelty had kind of worn off a little bit. And I was like, I need my MCU shit back. Like, (laughs) hello, I'm paying Disney Plus money for MCU. Where's the MCU? (laughs) And then on time, as Marvel (laughs) usually is, it showed up episode four. So in episode six, they... They've got this running like a fucking machine. We've got the perfect blend of the kookiness going inside the hex, and we've got all types of shenanigans happening outside of it in in the real MCU. Um, (laughs) And we start to see Vision starting to get pissed off, which we have Mm -hmm. never seen before. Great moment of character development, and you're just like, wait a second, who is this dude? He's like visibly pissed, but he's trying to play his usual role and not get Wanda too upset. You've got Quicksilver, yeah. who I love and adore, <laughs> you know, um, giving Mark some tasty, you know, hints like unleash hell <laughs> demon spawn that he can oh, go and run with so with his confusing. Mephisto shit. But he's also like calling Wanda out on her shit, you know? He says things like, you know, if I found Shangri-La, I wouldn't want to be reminded of my past either. Like he's, you know, Agatha sends him in to be a little bit of a, a prod. And quite frankly, I enjoy that. We need to see Wanda uncomfortable. We need to see her being like, what the fuck is going on here? This is my world. And what are you doing to screw it up? Um, The kids get their powers. Yep. One zipping around. I can never remember which one's Tommy and which one is fucking Billy, but one <laughs> is running around with Quicksilver powers. The other one is now, you know, able to to read people's minds and hear voices. And and then you've got Vision out there learning about the madness that is this hex. Yeah. And we get the true horror show with that poor woman stuck in that loop oh yeah crying it is one of the most amazing scenes in the entire show and you're just like what is going on here what has wanda done yeah is she the bad guy and that's when the conversation starts to shift yeah and it's just an incredible incredible turning point I just I love the shit out of that episode. Like once I got to it, I was like, yeah, this is it. I mean, there's 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 a lot to be said for the penultimate episode as well. But episode six was just a a massive turning point where so much happens and every character is on fire. Every single last one of them. You know, you've got Hayward and Monica and Jimmy Woo fighting. (laughs) <laughs> like it finally <laughs> turns up and you're like hey we're such a little shit and they're fighting back and jimmy actually kicks off the whole fight and you're like okay agent Wu, i see you <laughs> this is amazing a little bit of growth for him as well a little bit of a badass moment because we know monica's a fucking badass like we've known that from the beginning but this episode literally has everything yeah there's some but i I, for, I forgot to mention that also at the end of the episode just and we're thinking that oh my god what is so fucking powerful that she's actually monitoring and writing the lives of every single townsperson yeah she then expands the fucking hex at the end of the episode like this woman's power, we're just like, it, does it know any bounds? Like, you really start to wonder about Wanda. What is she capable of? And what the fuck is she doing to these people? And how does she confront the limits of her power? Because she, her, her, her way of sort of handling the limits of her power go two directions. One is to sort of like let those people kind of roam around at the edges of town right? In just this sort of weird dream state because she doesn't really need them, right? So until she needs them, she's just not really going to activate them. They're kind of like sleeper agents out there. And then when she confronts the limits of her power with respect to Hayward, she just expands the town and turns it into a circus, which is one of my favorite things about this series that I feel like, 
you know, in all the things I read online, I didn't, I didn't find anything satisfying about why she turns everything into a circus. But I think it's fucking great that she turns the essentially the American military into a circus. I mean, come yes. on. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I could not agree more. That definitely plays into something. You guys have both mentioned something that plays into one of my answers later. I agree, Christine. This was a torture question. I felt terrible every time I was watching another episode and the rewatch because I was writing down all these notes about how this is obviously my favorite episode. Right. And then this is obviously my favorite episode. <laughs> you made such compelling cases and neither of those are even in my top three, which is how incredible. I think this episode is. Hmm. So, you know, I asked what was the best episode. And hmm. so I will, I, my favorite episode is probably episode two because of drunk vision and the weird color stuff and, it, you know, Dottie's <laughs> all wild. But that's not the best episode for me. I do hmm. think episode seven, Breaking the Fourth Wall, which is the Modern Family episode that we were talking about with the meme stuff. Obviously, Staycation Wanda was hilarious and dark. You get the Vision and Darcy team up, which is That's just so chemistry great. off the yeah. charts and these really disparate elements of the MCU coming together, including Vision's meta mock interview where he storms off the set of the non-existent <laughs> so good. show. Runs into the boom. <laughs> and what, you know, along with the answers to a lot of questions about like Sparky and Pietro and what was going on, we got a ton of information, but the, the clincher for me really is that Agatha all along happens at the end of the episode. And, mm. you know, that was a my runner up for the, the, the thing that I think about most when I reflect on this show. It was oh, yeah. just so fun and funny and everything I want from a show like this that between Wanda's incredible performance impersonating basically Julie Bowen's character from Modern Family and that ending, it's just... Uh, you know, I just think about all the little things like Wanda losing control of her powers a bit with the milk changing and the house changing and her not giving a shit what happens to her kids for a little bit. It was some real some realness. And I I, I really think episode seven is is spectacular. So it's, it's a, it speaks so well of the show that we've just got all these other options because, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's also episode four where we finally get all those MCU yeah. things you're talking about, Christine. I mean, my goodness. Anyway. But we also get the birth of a superhero. In your mm. episode, Monica goes through the hex. Oh, that's true. We even get Monica yeah. beginning like her journey as Spectrum, which is going to matter even more in the MCU. All right. Well, let's drill in a little deeper and talk about the single best scene of the series. Christine, do you have one? Again, such a rude question. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, there's there's one scene that I think is so fucking funny. I have to mention it as a honorable mention. And that's Vision and Wanda's magic show. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> when Vision is running around gummed up and <laughs> acting as though he's drunk, you know, to the townspeople. And every five seconds, he's going, flourish, <laughs> flourish, <laughs> I die. That that scene is so fucking good. <laughs> like, I laugh every time I, I watch it. But in terms of the single best, most perfect scene, as someone who is obsessed with the MCU, I feel like there is only one answer to this question, as weird as it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's Monica coming back from the blip. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah. yeah. Oof. Mm -hmm. Because we we were thirsty at this point, folks. We were thirsty for any indication of what the fuck happened in that moment on the ground. Like, sure, we saw what happened when Banner snapped his finger and brought everybody back and but then next thing you know, it's just like a bunch of butterflies and birds and, you know, Agent 19 calling Clint um, to be like, hey, honey, I'm back. Uh, but we don't really see what happens on the ground. We don't know how people came back, like what they looked like, the form that they took, how did. And it just answered so many questions. It was incredibly sa satisfying. It was horrifying. Mm -hmm. to come back to Maeve's theme. Um, 
And it's it's a vision that I see when I close my eyes sometimes. It's just mm-hmm. Monica coming back together. And the sheer horror and confusion mm-hmm. and and yeah, and pain. Oh, it is just such a good, terribly painful and yet yeah. enlightening scene as a fan of the MCU. You finally get a little bit of the real shit. They did a really good job using that that moment. They used it so efficiently to help us understand what the consequences of coming back mm-hmm. like that would be because realizing that her mother is dead, right? It's I mean within in the space of a few minutes we know exactly what it would be like to come back in that way to a world that has been radically altered in which you have lost people and not and don't even know it in the blink of an eye. Yeah, I mean, now I want a Monica Yelena ma- mashup show because I just feel like they, they went through something really similar, losing mm-hmm. their mom and sister in this same way where it's like you're saying, maybe they don't even have a chance to grieve really because the whole yeah. world has moved on years ago. Right. Yeah. So what do you do when the whole world acts like this incredibly devastating thing that just happened to you is old news? That's harrowing. Maeve, do you have a... A, a nominee for the single best scene of WandaVision. <laughs> you know, Christine, when you were saying, you know, this is, this is uh, argue, this is definitely the single best scene. I was like, oh, she's totally going to name my scene. She's totally going to name my scene. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, Welcome when to I, How I Talk, Maeve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. I love Everybody's it. wrong. Because <laughs> when I close my eyes, I see the moment that Wanda unravels the universe. Because mm. it, it still, I rewatched that scene again today, still makes me weep every single time. It, in part, not just because it's sad. It's not just that she's losing everything that she's built to try to rebuild herself, but also because the show manages to do something really profound to go back to something that you were saying, Christine, with the family in that, in that scene. So that, you know, they, they're coming back from town. They're, you know, Wanda and Vision are both dressed as superheroes. And uh, as they as they walk up the pathway, we get one of those very standard, like this show loved Stanley Kubrick style shots, right? Like center wide, you know, centered humans, wide angles, right? People at the center of a universe that they're not controlling. And uh, they as they walk into the house, they turn into their family selves. You know, she's in jeans, he's in, I don't know, khakis or something. Um, and they come into the house and, 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 and basically it's two scenes that are tied to one another where they are bidding farewell to the children and then they're bidding farewell to one another. And Wanda says to the kids something that I think would otherwise sound really trite and cliched. She says a family is forever. And if you haven't seen the entire show, you'd be like, oh, groan, right? You know, but in this context, it's really powerful because f- for her – this family that she made has got to be good enough forever for her to let go of it, for it to be adequate to help her take the next step in recuperating from her loss. The thing that she had only temporarily has got to be forever. It has to be enough. And then when she and Vision are talking to one another and, you know, it, it starts with, you know, him turning the light on and, and you know, him saying, you know, I wanted to see you clearly. It, it's, it's also a, a moment where he doesn't, he doesn't forgive her for what she's done, but he lets her know that he loves her regardless. And I think it's, it's just a, it's a really beautiful meditation on what a family can be and what love can be. And it's not trite, even though, they're sort of you in the same way that they use the sort of they use the tropes of the American sitcom, which is trite and cliched, right? In the same way that they do that, they they trot out something that sounds trite and cliched, and it's not. It's it is important. It does matter, and it's only you know in the way that the family has been the sort of new nu- the modern cisgender heterosexual nuclear family has been weaponized by modernity that it's a problem it's not a problem that we want to build families there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with the idea that we want human connections and we want intimate ones it's the problem is the way it's been weaponized and so the show manages to pull off in this final really profound sort of 
con- it's like a it's like nuclear it's so condensed right it's like this moment of connection and loss something that i'm not sure we've been able to say about the family when we are recognizing how damaging our conceptions of the normative family can be it manages to do something really beautiful i absolutely am obsessed with that scene yeah um I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks when I first watched it. And I remember shaking, sobbing when they were saying goodbye to one another. Yeah. But on (laughs) rewatch, I started crying at the walk to the house because I knew what was coming. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. Same. I was like, like, Rocky sobs. (laughs) Rocky sobs. Because I know, I know that this is it. This is the last moment that they're going to be together as a family. And quite frankly, this show is a love story. Yeah. This show ultimately is a love story between Wanda and her memory of vision. And he says that, I'm a memory made real. And it's so, I mean, that made me cry even more loudly. (laughs) I was like, oh, this is so amazing, this understanding. And who knows what I will be next. Yes. There's Mm. that hope, the optimism. We've said goodbye before. It it stands to reason that we'll say hello again. Hello again. I mean, it's it's a beautiful... I know I'm, I'm trying very hard not to cry myself. I'm like, oh, hold it back, same, hold same. it back. And like, there's there's a reason why I didn't say this was the best scene because it fucking destroys me, which is mm-hmm. exact. Every and time. I have said this a million and one times on this show. This is what I live for. This is what I love. This scene was so fucking destructive. Yeah. <laughs> and yet it created something in me that I had never had before And that was a genuine love for this couple Mm -hmm. because I did not understand them. I hated the two of them together going into this show. I didn't understand how they had a show. I was like, Marvel is taking a risk with this because these two are the dumbest thing in the whole fucking MCU. (laughs) Why are they a couple? Why are they a thing? What is this? That vibranium D must be great because I don't understand this shit at all. (laughs) And they made me fall in love with them. And I could not deny that watching that scene because Wanda wasn't crying. Vision shed one tear. I was crying for both of them. It's an incredible scene. And the other thing it did, right, is it took this really sort of nonsensical idea of like what even is vision and made Mm -hmm. it incredibly poetic with this, Mm -hmm. you know, you're the part of you're basically they gave us a little bit of the, you know, MCU magic science stuff with the part of the mind stone. But this this idea of the memory made whole, you know, or made, you know, brought to life kind of a thing. It just it turns something that would have been hokey if you thought too much about it into something beautiful. The more you think about it, which is a very difficult thing to do, especially in a superhero show. So there's a lot a lot there. And I had goosebumps the whole time you guys were talking about both scenes. So it's, it's an, again, another sign that you're right, Christine. These are, these are really brutal questions that I've foisted mm-hmm. upon you. <laughs> I'll just throw out one that I thought was the single best scene on the rewatch, especially. But man, the first time through, too. And that was Wanda and Vision fighting over the credits in episode oh, five, right? Yeah. Um, which is the, you know, on a very special episode. So that's the family ties like one. So first of all, that's a super original, weird meta moment in TV. You've never really seen that before. Here's the cre- I'm choosing to roll the credits, and we're not done yet with the credits still rolling. The other thing that I we had never gotten before was the vision angry ever mm-hmm. at anyone mm-hmm. at all. Yeah, and when he's like, "You don't get to make that decision for me," it's it was just <laughs> like rocked me to my core because this yeah. dude is super powerful. It was also Bettany at his best because even though he was acting mad, you could just see the the fear that was driving him like throughout that performance and Wanda was super close to falling apart. And then, of course, at this moment where everything is about to collapse, we get this new Pietro, this Evan Peters rolls in. It's this, Mm. again, shocking moment at a meta level for Marvel fans and I guess what I would say is the reason I think that that scene was the best scene is because from every aspect of it, the beginning of it with the credits to the end with Fiatro, it made me feel like anything 
was possible in this show. Mm -hmm. And that is not something I think you can traditionally say about Marvel, which has followed pretty solid standard tried and true story formulas. It felt like anything could happen at that point. And I loved that feeling. And I couldn't believe how much I felt it all over again, even though I knew how the show was going to end on the rewatch. This was the other scene that I was debating between. It was either going to ah. be that ending scene or is this scene because it's actually something that you said when we were recording StoryCast um, about this episode, Mark. We were talking about this, the end where he says, you don't get to make that choice for me. And Wanda tries to sort of soothe him by saying, you know, you're my husband, you're Tommy and Billy's father. And she says, isn't that enough? And you said something really interesting in the episode of StoryCast about this. You were talking about the fact that Vision's been forced to go outside and bury the dog in the backyard. And oh, yeah. this the end of this episode is important because it shows us the consequences of patriarchy for men too, right? That men are forced to fill these roles that are, are it, they're not, it, you know, yes, you know, patriarchy grants to men a privileged position of power in all kinds of domains, mm -hmm. but it also constrains their life possibilities too. And so this is a, this is, this is literally a, an envisioning of what that looks like of the, of the kind of difficulty of being forced into a role that you didn't choose, that you wouldn't choose if you had an opportunity to choose. And that is fundamentally really sort of De denigrating and degrading um, for for vision and for for anybody who feels like what they want is something different from the way that the world has sort of demanded you fulfill a particular kind of gendered role. Man, I completely forgot I said that. Yeah, you're brilliant. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh hey, my I'll, god! I'll don't take let it. him I'll don't let him it. get his head too big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me help shrink it, Mark. Let me help shrink it. <laughs> So are you are you sure that that was Paul Bettany at his best? You sure it wasn't Bettany versus Bettany? The seat, the <laughs> actor that he was looking forward to the most in Man. his career mm. <laughs> playing opposite. Paul Bettany as a social media performer was at his best with the like, you know, Bettany versus Bettany thing. Because that was also troll. an epic <laughs> troll. Speaking of theory is getting out of control and everyone predicting it's going to be like, Anthony Hopkins is going to roll in his Odin because that's who Paul Bettany once said he liked or something. It was that was nuts. Yeah, Bettany, Bettany. I don't know, man. I he is just amazing in this in this uh, thing. We'll, we'll talk more about him. All right, Maeve, we've been extolling its virtues, but now I want to <laughs> ask you to do something a little more harsh because nothing is perfect and that's OK. So talk to me about one thing that you think WandaVision got wrong or could have done better. Yeah, you know, I I kind of wish that the show had stayed weird. It starts mm. weird. It's weird in the way that it messes with the sitcom genre. It's com it's all it's almost psychedelic in its treatment of that form. And then in episode 8, it pivots from the sitcom to the more straightforward superhero story. Now, I I am ready to be proven wrong about this and I've been wrestling with this all day basically. Um but episode eight has kind of classic elements of the superhero story, super powered fight scenes. It's got a fantastical backstory. It's kind of got a hero's journey in it, right? We find out, you know, how Wanda became the Wanda that she is in the world that we're watching her in. But honestly, I did, I do think that the show did some of its most radical work when it was using the sitcom form to interrogate not just our conceptions of superheroes and their challenges, but the it, things like the American family, the American valorization of patriarchy, you know, obviously it's things that I'm, you know, you know, a little ham handed about. I'm like, let's get on it and talk about patriarchy. <laughs> um, but, you know, and maybe and maybe they couldn't do what they wanted to do in episodes eight and nine by sticking with the sitcom. Right. So we've got the flashback in episode eight it sort of gives us the narrative of how Wanda has gotten to the place that she is. And yes, some sitcoms have used flash flashbacks, right? Not often, and they often use them for comedic effect. So like, I was thinking about it today, like, you know, Friends uses that flashback. I mean, sorry, everybody, Friends, I hate that show, but it uses a flashback. Uh, Friends uses the flashback of Monica um, when she is larger than she is in Friends. And so it just becomes this like joke about fat, you know, sort of a fat phobic joke, um, I think the new girl uses a very similar uh, flashback when 
whoever that character is, is also larger than she is in New Girl. I know Malcolm in the Middle uses a kind of sappy flashback to when the mom is giving birth to the children. But in in those cases, either the flashback is like comic relief or a kind of comic ploy in the plot, or it's a way to kind of, in the Malcolm in the Middle case, it's like a way to shore up these kind of norms, right? Like, this is the mother, and she really does love being a mom, and that's great, and mm-hmm. yay, moms, and yay, mom roles. Um, but so, you know, on the one hand, I'm like, maybe they couldn't do what they wanted to do by staying with the sitcom. Maybe it's a way for the show to ask us to then look more critically at the sitcom. But also, I'm just like, I wanted it to stay weird. I wanted it to say, stay really formally experimental. Um and that's probably the, you know, the the annoying academic talking. So that's me telling you what I think and then discounting it uh, immediately. Uh, so, yeah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> that's the patriarchy you working on you, Maeve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I guess what I would say about that ending, too, is there's even a meta way they could have done it. Because I think they probably, given the context of the MCU as a whole, probably had to come back to the MCU. And like Christine, I confess that I was pretty hungry for it by episode four of this series, for example. But what they did do was come back to such a classic MCU style ending with them Mm -hmm. flying up in the sky and firing, you know, magic blasts at each other and stuff. I wonder if there would have been a way for them to subvert that and i think you could argue that the ship of theseus scene does do some of that but but only at a bite-sized level right they don't go the full buffet which the rest of the show had been doing so even if they had to step out of the sitcom there might have been a way to stay weird with it where they were commenting on marvel endings or marvel finales which have right. been not necessarily their strongest part of most of their movies i don't know because we talked mm-hmm. about marvel having a finale problem yeah. On character cast, you know, in Hawkeye. And I, I I don't know. Do you think that plays in here at all? See, but remember what we said and we, you know, spoiler alert kind of for Spider-Man uh, No Way Home. We talked about there being an emotional punch after all of the action being incredibly satisfying and uh, a better way of concluding things. And I think that's what they do here. I mean, Maven and True. I talked for like 20 minutes about how that last scene yeah. fucked us up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, and there's, and Wanda has her like, her walk through and, you know, all of that. And, but, you know, that's like three minutes, right? So the major, the major scene of the finale at the end, the finale of the finale is really, the tucking in the kids goodnight and saying goodbye yeah. with the hope yeah. of saying hello again to Vision. So, and and that is just one of the biggest gut punches the MCU has ever dealt us. So, I mean, I think I might be the only person on the entire uh, show, and I'm talking about Jesse and Amanda, who has no problems with the finale <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> like, I... I love the last two episodes of the show. I find it very hard, very, very, very hard (laughs) to answer this question. To me, this is actually the most difficult question because this is this is my favorite show of like the past five years because Game of Thrones fucked it in the end. So I can't even like this is above (laughs) Game of Thrones for me. And I've, you know, and like people have introduced me on other podcasts as a Game of Thrones expert. Like that's how much I fucking love Game of Thrones. Right. So for me to put WandaVision at the very top, like it's just hard for me to critique it. Every Every negative I have is like super cosmetic and I don't even have a fix for it because if I did, I'd be a writer for Marvel, right? So like, I feel that Dottie might have been a missed opportunity. I f- there was like more, op- there was something there with Dottie. They really yeah. they mm-hmm. brought her in as this really interesting character. And then she sidelined until the very end when we learned that her name is Sarah and she has a daughter that she would really like to be able to bring out into this little play world or like can you please let me hold her once i mean 
It's Anya, for goodness sake. Like, <laughs> utilize her. Emma Caulfield yeah. is fucking amazing. Um, yeah. And remember, she had talked about how Kevin Feige had to approve her casting. So we all got caught up in the theory casting yes. about her for weeks, too. Right. So she, yeah. I felt like she was underutilized. I feel like Hayward was also underutilized a little bit towards the end because it was just like... He was he was this big bad, and then all of a sudden it's like womp womp, you lost in five minutes, buddy. <laughs> like it just it, it it was weird. And but I'd say that the only critique I have, the only critique that I have of the final episode, is that I I could do with more Darcy. I could have done mm-hmm. with more Darcy. Yeah. So so okay. So good. Look look at that. I you found got I found you got one there. thing to complain about <laughs> in the finale. More Darcy Lewis, please. That might have been partly because of COVID scheduling, if I recall, that that they actually had rewritten that. There was a lot more going on, I think, between like Monica, Darcy, other characters that were going to do stuff together in the original drafts, if I recall. And I think some of the COVID scheduling, because this COVID interrupted this show and I think changed a lot about the finale. So first of all, I want to say, I really always love it when someone is like willing to go out on an island in, in the Marvelous TV Club because Marvel Universe makes it hard to sort of step out and have your own opinions. And I want to actually say you're not totally alone here because especially on this rewatch, Christine, I actually think the finale holds up way better mm. than it was given credit for at the time. I still mostly blame Theories Gone Wild, which <laughs> Marvel <laughs> has a bit of responsibility for in the other episodes because they made so many enticing little weird clues and hints to things. And there are so many Marvel comics properties that tie into those hints and quirks that I still kind of blame them. uh, Mark, 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 no, no, no. (laughs) No. (laughs) She was, she was mouthing off at me. So I just had to hit her to shut her up. No, (laughs) no, No, but the whole country was on like, a theory cast. If ride. the whole country jumped off a bridge, Mark, would you <laughs> jump off too? All right, mom. Probably, unfortunately, which is you know says a lot about. Aww, the state of things. he's a no, cancer and a people no. pleaser. We know this. Yeah. But no, but I think True. I think that the finale holds up really well, and I do think that it's in in large part because of exactly what you are coming back to from our character cast conversation, which is that. You know, we get the, all the gut punches at the end, and there really is a lot of super original stuff. You you convinced me even more in this conversation by bringing up the fact that it really does introduce all this. I'm a, I'm a memory, you know, made real kind of a thing. is so unusual yeah. and weird and cool that that's great. But I will say there is one thing that I do still hate about this <laughs> finale. I mean, and I I hate it. Say I hate more. this. I hate this. <laughs> Ralph Boner. Um, that yeah. joke is yeah. fucking bullshit. It completely kills the tone and mood of this finale, which is otherwise this sweeping epic. And then they just make a Ralph Boner joke. It cheapened the investment people had in who this guy was before. I feel like it was kind of a way of, it was one of the rare times I feel like Marvel was looking down their nose at their fans and treating them badly by investing in the fact that they cast a guy who played this character in another universe to come back here. It just sort of seemed like a fuck you troll. And the real reason that I think this joke is here is because Marvel still doesn't have the fucking guts to go for a full-on tragic story. They had to bring in a corny-ass boner joke so that this episode did not just rip you to pieces from start to finish. And I think that's weak sauce, and I'm not here for it. The Ralph Boner thing pissed me off even more in the rewatch, and it really pissed me off at the time. So that's where I land. I hate that joke, too. I mean, I'm also, look, I'm here for a, a stupid, you know, totally. adolescent joke. I love, I love an adolescent joke. I, I trot them out myself all the time. I probably say at least one to myself every day just to laugh. You know, I, but this one in the context of that episode where we're trying to tie up a show that is doing some really profound things, it just feels like that kid in the classroom when everybody is like really seriously trying hard to unpack something who, because they're not capable of like going deep like that, like comes up with some stupid ass joke and you're like, you're not actually funny. You're just an asshole. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. that's kind of how I yes. felt about that. I, I, yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. It made me actually hate Pietro as a character 
Yes. And that's not fair because like he actually does some interesting work. For example, in the in the episode the Christine that scene you were talking about, Christine, at the end of the spooktacular episode, where he he's just doing such amazing work there and trying to get Wanda to sort of actually look at herself. Like he can't possibly die twice, right? And she basically like <laughs> whatever, like blows him out, you know, off the hay bale or whatever. Like it's a great moment. And he's such a fascinating character in that context. And then all of a sudden I'm just like, fuck you, MCU. <laughs> Why you gotta do that? It's so stupid. Christine, do you disagree with us? You look like you disagree with us. Yeah. <laughs> no comment. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Damn. I'm glad Ralph Boner plays somebody. Um, <laughs> Cause it sure as fuck wasn't me. Okay. Well, you know, we're really moving sw swiftly here through the WandaVision <laughs> recap. Let's pivot to the second part of our discussion, though, because there's still a ton more to talk about, you guys. I want to get into some character stuff now. Christine, now that you've watched it again, I'm curious. I feel like we've talked about some of the stuff in our character cast for it, but we yeah. only got to do three episodes on WandaVision. Yeah. So this is our chance to really get into all of this. Looking back, though, who was your favorite character on the show and why? So I think you did ask me this question at the end of uh, our watch. And I honestly did not look to see what my notes were. I wouldn't be surprised if my answer was Dr. Darcy Lewis. Because uh, I think we both I think we both were like, it has to be somebody other than Wanda. So let's pick mm -hmm. somebody other than Wanda. My answer today is Wanda. Wanda is my mm. fucking answer. Okay. <laughs> she is my favorite character in this show because she is so desperately flawed and real and fucked up and powerful and Elizabeth Olsen is just absolute perfection in this show. The way she is able to move from character to character, period to period, accent to accent and mood to mood she was flawless in this show. She definitely demonstrated her chops. I mean, there's a lot of teasing before, you know, from folks like Anthony Mackie, who's like, oh, she's got this like hand choreographer. And that's all she does. It's just like this <laughs> hand movement and that's her acting, right? Elizabeth Olsen proved that she is a tremendous actor with this show. The range of <laughs> the range that she performed in this was just incredible. But Wanda was just a character that I deeply identified with in this episode. And her destructive nature of just fighting pain, fighting reality, doing whatever it takes to just like create this fantasy where everything's okay when everything is really on fire. Mm -hmm. Good Lord, do I identify with that as a black woman working in the social justice movement. <laughs> you know, like the world is literally on fire. And when I come into my apartment, I escape through the MCU. I mean, this is this is a soothing technique that I've used since the Trump years. That's when I really started going to the theaters at least twice a month, you know? I mean, way more interest than just the MCU, but that's when I really became committed more than anything to this genre. And and Wanda was just so similar in that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it might be a little narcissistic for me to be like, my favorite character reminds me of me, but it's more like, <laughs> reminds me of my struggles and like how I cope with them. And it's a huge mirror <laughs> to be like, Hey, you're a little fucked up kid. And that's okay. But you can't, you can't operate like this. You can't do it. You got to face what's going on and deal with it. And mm. her portrayal of Wanda Maximoff in this show is just such a good lesson. Um, so yeah, Wanda, Wanda's my favorite character. Yeah, spoiler alert. I mean, that is actually my <laughs> answer too. And I Yay! think it gets back to something <laughs> that Maeve talks about with the patriarchy, which is I think it's very easy to look past Wanda as the reason that this show 
is the absolute fucking best because she's doing all the work. She's carrying the whole load. And yet yeah. we're almost all sort of trained to like look elsewhere for the answer to this. And like you said, it's like everything we're talking about. She's amazing in every era of sitcom mm -hmm. and also has to carry all of those traditional MCU moments in the finales and also has to carry those scenes even in the post credit sequences. You know, she's just every moment she's on screen, almost every single scene in the show. She puts the whole thing on her back. She performs like seven versions of the same character. I've never seen anything like it in in anything in the MCU or really probably. I mean, I guess it's, you know, I guess you have like Orphan Black and some other shows like that where you get to kind of put that level of, you know, sort of diverse performance of, of the same kind of character on display. But oof, I mean, I I was not a hugely obsessed Wanda fan before I didn't think much about her as a character either way I loved her yeah. in the comics because when I was a kid there was some issues including the episodes where we get the like you know white vision and stuff from the West Coast Avengers but in the MCU it just didn't mean that much to me but oh rewatching it it's just hard to argue with your answers so so thanks yeah for I completely forgot she existed in the movies right when so WandaVision starts and mm -hmm. we, we hadn't even talked about doing a podcast I start watching and I'm like this is an amazing show who is that character <laughs> of course, mm, yeah. she's in the movies, but she's not in my mind because I just didn't remember her at all. She was unmemorable. But I think there's also something about and I, I don't know. I don't know how to describe this, but she manages to pull off playing a character that we all want to identify with. Mm -hmm. mm. And it's something about the way that she calls for our empathy. She does it perfectly, no matter what she's doing, no matter, even in that scene where she's fighting with Vision and she's like, isn't it enough that you're a husband and a father? It's like, and all of us are like, gross, <laughs> stop it, please. Um, I'm still like, I get it. I understand where you are. I feel you. And that's acting. That's, that's not just a good character. I mean, it's a well-written character, but it's also... It's acting, like being able to call for our empathy, even when she's doing something really kind of horrifying. Maeve, do you have a different answer to this question? I do have a different answer to the question, just to be a contrarian. Yay! <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, this is also going to be real obvious. Uh, you can probably guess who my favorite character is. Go ahead. Try. Hayward. No. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You're totally right. I'm really here for the uh, military industrial comp complex. Uh, no, it's Agatha. Agatha is my favorite character. Um, in large part because she is evil, but she's not the only evil in the universe. God damn it, here. Dr. Adams. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know, one of the things I love about the way that the show builds Agatha as a character is that she's a, a counterpoint to another evil character, right? Somebody who is classically evil, right? So Wanda is classically evil. She's hijacked the minds of other people. She's gaslit them. She's built a universe out of out of uh, on on their backs, using them as slaves. Um, but in both cases, both in the case of Wanda and in the case of Agatha, Agatha's evil is put in context for us, and that complexity, the complexity of how she came to be, quote unquote, bad. Um, of course, she is bad. She is evil. Um, but how she came to be bad is meaningful and resonant for us, right? It, it's that scene that we get of her as a witch back in the ye old, ye olden days with her mom running the coven. And, and you know, and essentially the, the problem here is that her mother, you know, is, is kind of, you know, autocratically running the, these women's lives and their use of their powers. And that creates the problem. Um, I think that's the context in which Agatha becomes evil and becomes greedy and becomes needy and starts to want to have all the power in the universe because it's been limited to her. Um, and I also think that that character is portrayed per to perfection. I mean, there's, we were talking about the spooktacular episode, you know, before where, you know, where Vision goes out to the edges of town and finds Agatha there in the car staring into space. And that's some exceptional acting in the universe of the show and for the show itself, her ability to pivot back and forth between these two characters, the one who's whammied and the one who's definitely all doing the whammying or helping do uh, encourage the whammying. So, yeah, I mean, I, 
I dressed up as Agatha for Halloween. I mean, need I say more? <laughs> and I did a bunch of winking. <laughs> it's so good. I also think about that moment in that fifth episode, a very special episode where she, you know, says the line, do you want me to take that again? Mm -hmm, and I just remember yeah. how unsettling that was. I cringe every time I see that yeah. scene because it, she makes me feel so uncomfortable. I love it. And the silence, the pure silence, like even when the audience isn't laughing, there's still there's still a sound like a almost an enveloping sound that uh, the sitcom has. But when it's taken out of it, that enveloping is gone. You were just it is pure silence. And I think that also adds to the unnerving in that moment. I, th I mean, the whole that whole scene was amazing, but you're right. If there's a contender that is not Wanda Maximoff <laughs> yeah. for who's who's the favorite character here, it's got to be Agatha. She's got her own theme song for Christ's sake. I like, know. of course she's up there. <laughs> and she killed Sparky. And she kills Sparky. Yeah. She's no compunction. Last bit. She killed her mom too. <laughs> totally killed her mom. <laughs> yeah, killed her mom. <laughs> And she was already like, you know, she clearly felt kind of weird about killing all the other witches. But then when she killed her mom, she was like, yeah, rock yeah. on self. I'm See, like, there's, Whoa. <laughs> there's something so fucking obnoxious about somebody who looks at what you have and they're like, oh, shit. No, wait, I am that person. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so like, They look at what you have and they're like. Fuck you. I need to take that and actually utilize it to what it should be, how it should be used. That is me when I see people in sports cars going like below the speed limit. I'm sorry. I just realized like, oh, shit, I'm talking about myself. Because when I see these motherfuckers on the street doing 20, when they could be doing 105, I'm like, mm -hmm. give me that car. You don't fucking deserve it. <laughs> Me and my little Honda Civic. Such monsters for obeying public safety laws. <laughs> listen, listen. <laughs> but there's something so fucking obnoxious about it. And I am no, I own my obnoxiousness. Fine. Yeah. But there's, oh, that, that part of her character, for me, makes her so fucking evil. You know? Yeah. I know better. I can do better with this. Sit down, Miss Breakfast for dinner. The fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next time you're driving past Christine in your sports car, just watch out for any purple energies that will be <laughs> trying to take take that car from you. That's no, cool. drive past me. If you drive past me, there won't be a problem. But if I drive mm. past you in my little Civic, you're fucking stupid. Okay, you stolen your <laughs> get off at the that road. Point. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> You're banished to the dark hole at that point. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's talk about a few of the less prominent characters. Maeve, do you have a favorite minor character from the show? Yeah, so my I, I think my favorite minor character has got to be Darcy Lewis. I mean, first of all, she's an academic -y type, so you know, I got I got the you know the the sort of mutual PhDs feeling of represent. respect. You know, PhDs. You know, we see each other. Hey, you. Um, but also she's one of the funniest characters in the show. I mean, she's hilarious when she shows up in the circus and she's like having the conversation with vision and it's just, she sees this as like a moment where they, he's like hit on her the night before or whatever. Like it's brilliant. She's hilarious. She handles that whole, like trying to get into town. Oh, come on. You know, the, you know, the, the lights turning, then somebody coming out to like drill a hole in the ground. Like she's amazing. She's hilarious. She's incredibly smart, and I love the fact that she's also like a badass on the right side of things. Yeah, that's my. She feeling. figured out the whole TV thing, right? In episode yeah. four, that was all Darcy. She's so genius, I know, and I love the fact that we, you know, are sort of celebrating this totally genius badass character who is also, you know, being celebrated for being super smart, right? Not just being like super powered in the like physical sense, but super powered in the intellectual sense. So, yeah, I'm in love with her. I think one of the reasons why I love Darcy is because she's <laughs> the audience, right? Yeah. Like she is mm. us on she's the, the show. Yeah, she's like the everyman. She's, yeah. She's great. asking yeah. all the questions that we were asking, right? Like when WandaVision started without any explanation and Wanda is there with Vision, you're like, and Vision dead? 
Like, what? <laughs> How? How did this happen? And yeah. the first thing she says when she's watching this shit is, he's dead, right? And I'm yeah. Like, yes, thank you. Somebody's yes. asking the questions that I'm asking. And, you know, she's, <laughs> when she was crying watching the show, watching Wanda give birth, and, you know, Jimmy teases her. She's like, I'm invested. I was like, bitch, me too. I'm invested <laughs> in the show. So she is, she is us. And I appreciated her speaking for me in the show. And doing it in a way that's so funny that I like wish I could have said those things, you know, like, you're like right. oh, nice, nice one. I wish I had said that. <laughs> You know, and they also kind of reclaimed her from the first two Thor movies, which are not mm. traditionally accepted as like the best of the MCU. I mean, I think Dark World is usually at the bottom of most people's lists. And even though she was really funny in those movies, she felt weird and out of place. Again, like they didn't really know what tone they were going for in those movies. And so to take her forward, you know, advance her as an actual astrophysics PhD, no longer just the intern for punchlines was also yeah. really cool because it made the universe feel more dynamic. Absolutely. Christine, is Darcy still your answer to the question of your favorite minor character, or have you got somebody else for us? I've got somebody else for y'all <laughs> on rewatch. <laughs> Can you guess who it is? Ooh. Jimmy Woo? Mm, yeah. It's actually mm. not Jimmy Woo this time. It's Ralph Boner. <gasps> oh, God damn it. Oh, rude. That's why I was sitting here like a fucking Cheshire cat the whole time. Y'all, Y'all crucified have seen this her. man. When I was lighting Ralph Boner up, Christine <laughs> leaned back from her microphone, lips pursed, Whatever. grinning, arms crossed. I was like, I was like, something is going to happen and I can't wait, yes. but I'm also a little scared. So here we it go. It was so delicious just sitting here listening to y'all rail, knowing full well I was going to extol all of his praises like 10 minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this podcast. Okay, so <laughs> Fietro. Mm. It's my absolute favorite minor character, at least on this rewatch, right? Like, I feel like my opinion changes and I learn more and I feel differently, um, more intently, less intently each time I, I watch the show. But Fietro, <laughs> I really appreciated him because I think what I've been in therapy now for it'll, it'll be two, maybe a year and a half. I really believe in doing the work, right? Like you need somebody who's going to call you out on your shit. And that is exactly what Fietro did for Wanda, my favorite character in the show. So even though he was a little shit and said things to needle her and bother her, if she's living in this fucking fantasy world, you need that person who's going to drag you out of it. He wasn't really dragging, but he was doing... More work than anybody else, even though it was on behalf of Agatha. Um, But in terms of minor characters, I think he was so impactful. He was so funny. And to me, Evan Peters was just a genius. He, that was X-Men Quicksilver to Mm -hmm. a T. And he is my favorite character out of all the X-Men. Okay, because of Evan Peters, the way he portrays him, the comedy that he brings and the physical comedy, that man's face says so much and he can make you laugh with an eyebrow raise or the way he sets his lips. Evan Peters is a fucking genius. But let me speak to the Ralph Boner moment Mm. (laughs) and why this doesn't why that moment takes away absolutely nothing for me from Fietro. I take shit way too seriously. <laughs> like the shit that I love way too seriously. There have been moments where I have definitely demonstrated it on this episode alone. <laughs> <laughs> like the fights that I get into talking about the Yankees and the Red Sox, like it's <laughs> over, right? I care way too fucking much. And guess what? I shouldn't. Because why? It doesn't fucking matter. It really doesn't in the large scheme of things. So when the MCU is like, bitch, you taking this way too seriously. (laughs) I'm going to hit you with a boner joke. I say, thank you very much, MCU. Thank you for the lesson. I will do the work. 
I will do the work. I appreciate this moment. I appreciate you trolling me. And I appreciate you not taking your own shit so seriously. Mm. That we can joke about these various worlds. That we can be like, hey, X-Men are coming. Wanda's going to usher in all the fucking mutants. Remember when we all thought the the hex was going to explode and like (laughs) activate the X gene or whatever? And then Marvel's like, (laughs) you're funny. You're so cute. You're so cute. Be patient and see what we do. We need time to think about this and set our cards up straight so that you are thoroughly entertained. So just slow your roll and enjoy this boner joke because we know (laughs) that all of you are still 12 years old inside and they are absolutely fucking right. I am still 12 years old inside. And that's why I can appreciate Ralph. I could appreciate a boner joke and I can appreciate the MCU telling me to not take all of this shit so seriously. I like the idea that like Pietro serves to call Wanda out on her shit and then serves to call the audience out on its shit. Exactly. That's, that's some nice symmetry there. I like that. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm here to I'm here to admit that maybe I was wrong about the boner joke. Uh, no, no, Mark is not. not Mark is not here for that. That's some fucking bullshit. <laughs> I will say I admire Christine. I admire your ability to sort of say, I'm cool with this boner joke that's trolling my ass for carrying it all. And then two <laughs> seconds later, I'm going to cry my eyes out when Vision is like this, has this incredibly poetic yep. death. Yep. I apparently am less emotionally in, uh, evolved than you are. And I am not <laughs> capable of that level of pendulum swing on my feelings. I was... Or Super maybe invested. I'm unhinged. <laughs> well, maybe. But Nothing either wrong way, with that. it sounds healthier because you were able to appreciate the boner joke. I would just love to know because actually giving him a silly name wouldn't have bothered me at all. But specifically, like that level of like th- it landed with a thud for me because it was such a, it felt like such a fuck you. I would love to know what the discussion was like in Jack Schaefer's writing room uh, when they decided with that specific last name i don't know man it's fascinating but i i love what you're bringing because that's exactly what i want to get out of these conversations is a totally new way to think about you know how i took in the show so that that totally accomplishes it for me i my answer is jimmy woo just because i think he had an arc inside of the series that i didn't Mm. really appreciate i think as much at the time that he starts off obviously he's mastered the art of magic which Mm -hmm. is cool because that was a nice little detail from picking up from the ant-man movies where he had not or had just started to be curious about it. But by the end, he is running stuff. And we see this evolution of Jimmy, who's very deferential to Tyler Hayward throughout the first handful of episodes. He's always about protocol first and chain of command and by the book. And to see Jimmy's growth and change throughout the episode was really heartwarming. And it won me over ultimately with his own episode moment when he pulls himself out of the handcuffs and is like flourish and i was like (laughs) holy shit this ties into drunk vision which is as christine was i think was talking about i was like you know the real you know and the magic he was an escape artist yeah exactly it all ties all ties that together so it's all love and roses and we love wandavision it's great it's the best but christine do you have a least favorite character or someone who didn't work for you we don't have to dwell on this i'm just curious if there was someone a character who left you wanting so this was pretty easy and for me it was Hayward. Mm-hmm. So um I felt like he had a lot of potential in the beginning and the way he played everybody was smart and then at the end it was just like ha ha I'm going to have the Bond villain moment where I tell you everything <laughs> that I'm going to do and why this is going to work and then 5 minutes later like his super robot goes off, has a academic conversation with the other <laughs> imaginary super robot and then flies off and it's all over. And then, you know, Dr. Darcy hits him with a fucking Hummer. So like it, after he right, shoots at some kids, you know, after he tried to murder two children, like you were such a piece of shit. But like and how. How did that come about? He he was he had so much potential at the beginning. And he was just ineffective, dumb, and murderous of children. I mean, mm-hmm. if that doesn't win you least favorite <laughs> character, I don't know what the fuck does. Maeve, do you have a counterpoint? 
Yeah, I think Dottie is such a missed opportunity. I mean, I know we already talked about this a little bit, so I don't want to go on and on forever and ever just because, but um, she was an avenue for so many cool subplots. Like there was like a whole space for a Stepford Wives thing going on there because she was a real Stepford Wivesy, you know, and that whole like, I'm running all the ladies and they're going to do what I want. Um, and then she just kind of like falls off the cliff and I'm like, where's Dottie? Where's Emma Caulfield? Best, best, best ever. Where's Anya? And she's gone. And I'm like, okay, I guess she's gone. And maybe that was a COVID thing. Like maybe that also was like a COVID mm. business or just like, or just a missed opportunity. So she's not my, my least favorite character. Cause she, you know, the it's, it's just cause she's underdeveloped. That's right. all. Yeah. She's underutilized. She yeah. yeah. So yeah. All right. I'm going to get real with you guys for a second. Um, <laughs> Wanda's kids are trash. What? Here's the thing. They're, <laughs> they're not, All right. they're not All good right. actors. Do you want to kill kids? Those kids are not good actors. I, I, we have to start there because they suffer through some tough dialogue, admittedly. There's a few things where they didn't get the best script moments, but they're just not great. They look at each other in these like super exaggerated ways, even in non-sitcom moments where it's not supposed to be like that. Their powers are pretty poorly explained. They don't really have any personalities besides Vision likes one and Wanda likes one because they named them. I think the kids are trash. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just let that sit there by yeah, itself. Disappointing. <laughs> disappointing. Yeah. You, you know, you talked about how Wanda and Vision didn't do it for you in the MCU going into the show. For me, that's how it's going to be when they come back in Young Avengers, Christine. Like, I, these kids are going to come back and they you. better have cast some fucking real actors or I'm going to be pissed. Listen, or maybe the kids will get some acting lessons because they're, they're adorable. But like, they're very I, cute. I hear you. I just kind of chalked it up to the sitcom shit. And I was just like, okay, yeah. they're just exaggerating. But I also can't bring myself to say the kids are trash. So kudos <laughs> to you. Well, you just said it, so I can clip it where you just say that part and I can have it replace where I said it and put that in where you said it. And then I'll be like, I agree, Christine, with your radical position on these children. <laughs> well, I'm clearly the actual vision of this. <laughs> God damn it. Well, I'm clearly the actual... <laughs> I keep saying the wrong word. Uh, no, because I said vision last time too. It's just because I'm saying the wrong word. Uh, 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 this is good. This is good. Uh, you got to keep all this, Mark. No, I'm not uh, keeping this part in. No, I, I, that's got to be. That's got to be like a, a like after the credits to, or whatever, or right credits. when we'll the see, we'll or see. right when the episode starts. Yeah, if people are still hanging with us an hour and forty five in. Maybe we'll just leave this part in. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Who's who? Am I supposed to talk to now? I think it's me. May. Right? Yeah. Right, yeah. All right. I am clearly the actual villain of this podcast based on <laughs> my recent answer. Correct. That seems, that seems a fair assessment, Mark. Well done. Maeve, who is the actual villain of WandaVision? When you look at it all, total it all up, who's the actual villain? This one was easy for me. It's Hayward. Hayward is evil. The military industrial complex produces evil. It is led by evil. And one of the things I think is really great about this is that, like so many superhero stories create a kind of state of exceptionalism around superheroes, right? Superheroes can do whatever they want to do. Consequences be damned. Collateral damage be damned. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, they're saving lives and saving worlds, right? Essentially kind of saving the nation state, right? Most superhero stories fundamentally kind of save the nation state. And in the process of doing that, superheroes get kind of allied to the idea of superpower of the, of superpowers like the superpowers around the globe as allied to superpowers that inside a human being that makes them superheroes and this show does something awesome in wrenching those two things apart so hayward who stands for the american military and the american militaristic way is actually evil and superheroes over here are working out their shit in their own way, not relying on this state of exceptionalism that the modern nation state in imaginary universes grants to the superpowered as it grants in the real world to the superpowers of the world. So I'm here for all of that. That is, and even though Hayward disappears, like even though he might be a sort of underdeveloped character, the brilliance of that unpacking 
is enough for me. I'm like, leave Hayward exactly how he is if that's how it's got to be in order to do this work. So yeah, so he's he's evil. He is the evil of the show for me. So first of all, he is directly responsible for causing the anomaly, right? Wanda was trying to get into the sword complex for a bunch of minutes, meaning that he had plenty of time to clear out his texts that were sawing Vision apart when she walked in. Instead, he chose to leave them there and probably actually was taking the time to stage that entire scene to swing his tiny little dick and show that he's the big boss to this superhero. If he had handled her grief with compassion when she came to that facility, it is entirely possible that she could have had a more productive grief process that would have prevented all of this. So at a basic level, like the plot-based reasons, I think he's the villain. But he's also not alone as the voice of the military-industrial complex. Hydra, the Stark bombs, even Ultron as the cause of Pietro's death are all derived from the military-industrial state. And as you say, like the visions doing a fight with logic and not with bombs at the end serves to call mm -hmm. out you know, the alternative. So I'm just, I'm 100% with you, basically. I think it's, I think it's the military industrial complex. And I love what you're saying about that moment with, with Hayward and Wanda, because that's a kind of microcosm of the way that the military industrial complex also deals with PTSD, right? Like, so, oh, mm. so we, you have a problem. Oh, you know what? We're just going to send you back to war because you are a servant of the American military, Right. So it's this sort of like utter disregard of an utter dis incapacity to actually express any kind of compassion towards people's suffering. I mean, you can tell I love the American military. Okay. Um, but, but I think what you're saying is really interesting in that context because his, it is a kind of microcosm of this larger problem and a larger problem that, that, that reverberates way outside what we might think of as the kind of jockeying between powers at the nation state level and down to the level of the human experience of, of, of trauma and war and violence. So yes, thank you for saying that. Cause that was thank you for another that. moment of brilliance, Mark. Christine, do you want to interrupt this love fest? Do you have a villain for WandaVision? <laughs> no, I'm not going to interrupt it. I'm going to build on it. I'm going to say, yes, like yes. the villain is Hayward. Yes. The villain is also Wanda. Like yeah. I and I just I have to make the case for it because everything that Maeve said at the top of her answer applies to Wanda as well. Mm. She created a fantasy world for all of these people to live in, including herself, and kept telling them, You're okay. Yeah. It's fine. You're happy. And and they're literally at the end telling her, I have your nightmares. Like, no, 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 no. Everything is okay. She gaslights the shit out of all of them. Yeah. <laughs> Even though we see in the penultimate episode when Agatha is taking her through the worst episode of This Is Your Life Ever. And we get to the moment where she drives into Westview for the first time. It's a dilapidated town. Either... It did not survive the blip well. The economy is just shit. And like, yeah. it's a really sad looking place. And she turns it supposedly into this fantasy world for everyone where everyone's happy and everyone's delighted. And they want her to kill them instead yeah. of living in it. If you won't let us go, will you just let us die, please? It's what they tell her. Pretty bad. And she's she has the nerve to stand there and gaslight them and tell them that your lives are okay and I didn't mean it. I didn't mean to accidentally bomb your hospital. I was trying to bomb the military complex down yeah. the road. You know? Like, there's collateral damage in her grief. And they're saying, hi, we're here. We're your collateral damage. And she's like... Don't worry, honey. It's okay. I can make it all right. No, the fuck you can't. Yeah, and it's wow. perfectly fine if I this. imprison you here because actually it's in the service of a of a, of a vision of of 
of a perfect universe. I mean, I mean, this is a stretch, I realize, but I was listening to this piece about Guantanamo Bay earlier today. And like when you were talking about them sort of being stuck in this universe in the service of this thing, like just calm down, it's going to be fine. It's like telling the rest of the world, hey, it's fine that we've imprisoned all these people in Guantanamo. Because right. like, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe, no, you know, they're not experiencing the benefits of, I don't know, a very fundamental thing like habeas corpus. But uh, you know what? In the service of this larger vision, of stability around right. the globe, we're going to imprison people for, uh, forever without yep. due process. Right. Like, I mean, and I, I, I know that there's a bit of a stretch that I'm making here, but I think you're right that, you know, that there's something really, she is not immune from that critique is what I'm saying. She's not immune from the critique that Hayward is subject to in that yeah. context. And it, and I want to call back to an argument I made earlier when I was kind of teasing Mark about, you know, <laughs> kind of forced me into this situation. You're like, oh, you know, if the lady's mouthing off, you know, she's, she's mouthing off. So I smacked her, you know, not that big a deal. I mean, Hayward fucked with her 100%. Like he yeah. wanted mm. her to do something and bring, he, she, he wanted her to bring back vision. And he didn't expect it to go exactly the way that it did, but this was all part of his plan. So 100%, mm -hmm. he's a villain and he triggered her, but we still have to take ownership over our own actions. Yeah. yeah. I can't put all the blame on Hayward. Wanda is the one who utilized her power in this way. And even when she knew she was doing it, she kept going. Yeah. I can honestly say I had never thought about that connection between her behavior and collateral damage in the military industrial complexes. That's a that's amazing. So leads me to my next question for you, though, Christine, which is how do you feel about the resolution at the end for Wanda? Like, do you feel she paid for her crimes and should she have? I'm going to turn the question around to you <laughs> and say, can she pay for her crimes like can she be held accountable by someone who is not Wanda Maximoff yeah so in the that's finale a great point. yeah I mean it's a rhetorical question <laughs> <laughs> she's not interested in your answer but. Roger that <laughs> <laughs> but Agatha says reading from the dark hold that Wanda is more powerful than the Sorcerer Supreme the Sorcerer Supreme is the one who kicked off the defeat of Thanos eventually and bringing everyone back. Okay. I, that is some powerful shit right there. Okay. And she is more powerful than the most powerful magical being on earth. She is number one on this planet in terms mm. of humans. Okay. She is the number one power. How do you hold the number one power accountable unless she herself agrees to be held accountable. She is the only person who can punish herself. Look at the UN. We're arguably one of, if not the most powerful nation in the world. We do whatever the fuck we want. The mm -hmm. UN be damned. The fuck are you going to do to us? What are you going to do? Even if the entire UN says X, we're going to go and do Y. Why? Because we're the United fucking States of America and we've got a big dick. That's what we think. So that's what we're going to go and do. Right. Wanda punishes herself the only way she knows how. And that's to isolate herself from everyone from the whole world far away back in Sokovia where she can grow her rose blossoms or cherry blossoms, or whatever the fuck it is tree that she's in in the trailer for, for her, um, the next Doctor Strange movie. And just takes herself out of the game. There's no way you can punish Wanda Maximoff. She's the only one who could do it. What about emotionally? Because Monica lets her off the fucking hook with they'll never know what you've sacrificed. I feel like yeah, she that was, was looking to Monica to maybe hold her to account a little bit more. Certainly was I was moment. as an audience member. Yeah, and I think that was... Monica speaking for the showrunner is trying to tell us how to feel and it didn't really work as a character moment for Monica or for for Wanda. So that's the one moment I feel like 
You could have made Wanda feel bad. I'm not sure that sending her on a shame spiral would have been great for everyone's health and safety. Right. So maybe Monica was just making the strategic call to move this Greek god level power along before she, you know, obliterates everybody and and, because she feels bad. I don't know. Right. Yeah. You know, so like maybe I'm misremembering that exchange between Wanda and Monica, but I feel like that conversation is less about Monica giving her permission as it is a reminder to Wanda that these people haven't forgiven you. Like that's not the, the option here isn't to be like, Oh, everything's gonna be fine. You know, you need to let them go. You need to let them have their lives. And then you just need to walk away from this. And there's a reminder that Monica is going to be is that Monica cares about her still. I just, maybe I'm, maybe I misread that. No, I feel like that's fair. Yeah, well, I guess what I would say to that, though, is they actually do know what she sacrificed because we just heard from Dottie slash Sarah about how she wasn't able to even see her kid hold her for child, a week yeah. or touch At her all. child because of what Wanda was doing for her. So I think they actually know quite literally what it's like to, you know, sort of have to lose your children over like unfair circumstances. And so I don't know. I still feel like there was some some way for, for Monica to say something compassionate that doesn't forefront Wanda as the ultimate victim here. I guess at least my perspective on the whether or not Wanda has like adequately paid for her crimes or if she deserves to be punished for them has more to do with the way that I read the show overall that that it's a show that's interested in us trying to understand what it's like for a traumatized person to grapple with their trauma. And she's made all these mistakes. And yes, there are people who have been irrevocably damaged in the process of her trying to deal with this. But the show is also interested in thinking about the relationship between what we might think of as justice and what we think of as redemption. Because when at the end, when, you know, when, when vision, you know, turns the light on and, and she's, I think she kind of assumes that he, you know, wants to kind of like give her a talking to before he dies again, you know, and he's like, I just wanted to see you more clearly. And that because seeing her as understanding her. And I think that's kind of what the show is asking us to do also yeah. to see and understand her. And if there's a bigger lesson to learn from that, you know, yes, the people of Westview aren't going to for- forget and they're not going to forgive her. But what would it get them if Wanda were to be punished more severely, if we were to lock her up and throw away the key, sure. right? They're not going to get anything out of that. And so, you know, let, even if they were able to do that, even if they were able to build some kind of containment, you know, f- facility for her, I, there's something I think kind of extraordinary about the MCO, not only banishing the military industrial complex as evil, but also telling us a story about the idea that humans aren't disposable. We don't just throw humans away when, when they are potentially redeemable. And Wanda demonstrates a capacity to be redeemed. She ends, she ends it on her, on, you know, of her own accord. She makes the choice to end it because she could keep going. She could keep doing this forever, and she chooses not to. And so if she's redeemable, why not give her a chance to be redeemed? Well, speaking of locking someone up and throwing away the key and (laughs) Wanda maybe being the villain of this podcast and maybe getting away with a little too much, let's talk about what she did to Agatha at the end of this. How do you feel about Agatha being locked away in this fake personality looking behind the eyes of this oakley dokely Ned Flanders character, Maeve. Was it fair? Do you support it? Or what would you have done? Yeah, it's a hard pass for me. I don't like this at all. I didn't like it. I thought it was an expediency of the plot. I mean, like, if if we're talking about anything that, like, kind of, like, fucks up your love for something, like boner jokes in the context of something that, you know, feels really profound, it's this. I hated that moment. And I basically just had to kind of pretend it didn't happen because it's a plot device and it's an expediency that's kind of thrown in to like fix, to to keep the narrative going because it's not about Agatha any longer. It's about Wanda. 
but it really undercuts. If if what I am saying is true about the show saying you can't, you know, mm -hmm. dispose of human beings that way, we have to believe in the redeemability of humans, obviously understanding that some humans are just not redeemable. Some humans are too damaged to be redeemed. Um, and I'm, I, you know, I don't want to get into that at the moment, but it, we can't undercut that. We can't undercut that message about justice by throwing away the key on, on Agatha. I mean, there's that like one moment where Wanda's like, says something about coming back and, you know, seeing her again. So there's some kind of hope that maybe, but, but then Wanda is like the ultimate justice with no court. I mean, come on, like, no. So that's, yeah, no, no. I, I hate, I hate that. That's, it did not work for me. I, it's okay. So my reaction to this scene had nothing to do with the plot. Mm. So mm. I can't, I don't even know how to speak to what you just said, Maeve, because I, I need, I feel like I need time to digest it because what you said is really strong. And I'm like, holy fuck. <laughs> I have not, <laughs> I have not analyzed this scene from that. You know me, guys. I lead with emotion when it comes to this show. And it's just like, how how did I literally feel when this happened? And I was just like, this is fucked up. Like, to me, this is the cruelest thing that Wanda does in the entire show. Because at least, like, the creating of the Hex was an accident. It was just... It was natural for her. She didn't know she was doing it. And then when she was in it, she didn't realize what was going on until there were these clues until someone was like, no, this is like you have taken this town hostage. Like, what the fuck? Um, this is Wanda demonstrating her ascension to God status for yeah. me. Yeah. This is Old Testament God doing some serious smoting and punishing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you look back, your wife will turn to a pillar of salt type shit, right? Like some really fucked up shit. Because we know the hell that Agatha is now suffering. It's not like she became Agnes. She no. is Agatha She's trapped, trapped in Agnes. Yeah. And yeah. I had exactly one bad trip in my life where I felt <laughs> like I was locked in my brain and my brain was like this runaway train and I was locked in the trunk. And it was it was a bad it was a bad time. You guys, I cannot imagine that being the rest of my life. I would be in an asylum. Because. You're and and to the rest of the world, you're just this like folksy, nosy neighbor who's trapped <laughs> in the 60s, you know, like yeah. no one's going to know that something is seriously wrong with her because she's not presenting that way. And yet she is trapped in her own mind. It is the cruelest fucking thing you could do to someone. How does she maintain her sanity? Probably doesn't. But do you think it's true that nobody knows who she is? Because she was just flying around. They All the Westview people saw her as Agatha, as this mm -hmm. evil witch. I feel like the other wild implication of this is that she forces the people of Westview to be her prison guards for free forever after everything oh. that, that she's oh. done to them. When they come back to town, they have to see Agatha. Yep. She's a walking reminder, too. Yeah. And they'll never be able to get over it. They'll never be able to deal with it. They just have to guard this person, be terrified of the moment when she finds a way out of this little prison. It's an extra special hell for the people of Westview. I really I just couldn't believe that they went yeah. there. Because I think you can make an argument. Wanda indicates, you know, I'll see you again. There's an argument that Wanda makes a sort of case that she's going to come back and fix this and it's not going to be that bad. You could try to make some case that Agatha will be okay or Wanda won't let it get too bad. But she, she, you definitely can't do that for the people of Westview unless all of those people get to relocate for free. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, Agatha gets transported somewhere else, which maybe is going to happen or something. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe she's going to end up in her own kind of containment cell. 
I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It creates all the the problem is that if 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 we play that out, it creates all this complexity for the story that doesn't actually make a ton of sense given what we see at the very very end, which is this meditative moment where you know Wanda is trying to like find herself again and we are all assuming that she's been given the space to redeem herself fully and that she will. I mean, otherwise why would we put her in a cute little cabin somewhere, you know, drinking cups of tea and like doing okay? Like Right. Hey, and also the whole nosy neighbor trope is so trite and misogynistic. Like, come on, this whole show has done such good work. Like, it just, yeah, still mad. Well, let's hope that with House of Harkness, which we'll be getting eventually, we will learn that there's something less terrible going on here (laughs) or that there's been some modification after Wanda had a cooling off period in her little Hulk-like mountain retreat. But let's talk about where Wanda is and where Wanda is going as our final question on this epic, epic conversation reflecting on all of WandaVision. Christine, Wanda's got a big role coming up in the new Doctor Strange movie. This is not news. Her kids are also potentially trapped in hell, maybe with a certain devil named Amethysto, perhaps? <laughs> perhaps. Um, in the whatever. house of M. Yeah, in the house of M. So I just... You know, I'm curious uh, what your final thoughts are on what WandaVision might suggest uh, is ahead for Wanda as a character. Well, I just kind of alluded to it a little bit. Um, Wanda's at God level. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. there's there is power in her future power and a self fear of that power. I think she is scared of herself. And. I think the the post credit scene where we see her with Darkhold, it calls back to what Agatha tells her when they're fighting. Power isn't your problem. It's knowledge. So Mm. I wouldn't be surprised if Wanda is really trying to focus on her power, trying to learn more about it, learning how to control it. Because after this whole incident, she's got to be afraid of what she can do. At least I would hope so. Theoretically, she's the most powerful being, you know, in in this universe. So it seems, it stands to reason that she would be the one that you go to. And she's also in some control because I think you're exactly right. She's terrified of her own capacities and trying to control them and, you know, trimming trees as a way to, I don't know, kind of feel more in touch with the it's world. It's like a bonsai, her. right? She's definitely having yeah, it was her just own a meditation. Say, it seems very <laughs> much like that, that it's part of a meditative part, hopefully, of her practice of connecting yeah. with nature and caring for, for nature and all of that good stuff. And then it's also like a part of her story about redemption, right? It's about how she redeems herself by being the, the better, the, the better being. But the here's the thing, who, like, I mm. I wonder if I want redemption for her. Do I? Do I not? I, listen, Wanda, Wanda Maximoff being powerful ass Wanda Maximoff makes for good entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm very interested in whether or not she all of a sudden goes a hundred percent good i love her flawed i mean that's why she's my favorite character in the show because she's so fucking flawed um i would appreciate her continuing that healing definitely but i don't want her to be perfect and good like all of a sudden she's like captain america or thor-esque where it's just like oh they're such a good person and oh there's other things that's like making them challenged a little bit but like no like (laughs) be a little fucked up be a little fucked up like it it just yeah for me makes you a more interesting character yeah if you're gonna if we're gonna tell a story about a, a character that's you know, arguably evil at one point and becoming not evil I want to hear a story about Echo not necessarily a story about Wanda right I also thought about the end of Spider-Man No Way Home. So spoiler alert, if for some reason you have not brought yourself to see that incredible movie, but 
you know, at the end, we realized this was kind of an origin story. These three movies right. were kind of a re- an origin story. And I was struck by how much the end of WandaVision reminded me of that on this rewatch mm-hmm. that, you know, you're the Scarlet Witch. And she's sort of finally at the end of this journey that began all the way back in Age of Ultron. She finally became this new character. But then it also made me think about a comic book series that had a very bad movie that we all should forget about. Um in which Jean Grey as Phoenix became the Dark Phoenix (laughs) because she essentially had this power that she couldn't really ultimately control and had to make a difficult choice to sacrifice herself rather than potentially destroy, I think, at that point in the comics, like the galaxy. So the fact that the Scarlet Witch is fated to destroy the world struck me as reminiscent of this arc and with a little bit of a tie-in to those X-Men movies through Evan Peters and stuff, it just made me wonder if... Wanda has a sort of dark phoenix arc ahead of us where she will have to make a difficult sacrifice, perhaps to save her children, for example, or something like mm. that. So we'll we'll see what's ahead for Wanda because we're not that far away. Multiverse of Madness mm. is almost upon us. I'm I'm even more excited after this incredible conversation. So thank you both so very much. I think I had my mind blown like seven times at least in this conversation (laughs) in ways I hadn't thought about. And that's probably underselling it. So I had goosebumps all over again. I got choked up a little bit there when you guys were talking a few times. So thank you for that incredible roller coaster. Thank you. This was so fun. Both of you. Thank you. This was I, and I live for a crossover moment. So this was fun doing a story cast, character cast kind of combo. It was fun. I've been dreaming of uh, podcasting with Dr. A. I thought that she was going to be my my podcast nemesis. Um, I can't even remember what it was that started that. I think it was during Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You said something and I was like, <gasps> oh, my God. Incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad that I've disabused you of that potentiality. And now now we're best buds. Yay! Team up! Yay! It's like Agatha and Wanda. And, and I am the vision after all. See, it all comes together, you guys. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Uh, look, Maeve, if people want to talk to you more about all the incredible ways in which you uh, analyze WandaVision academically, where can they find and follow you? You can find and follow me on Twitter at Maeve Adams, M-A-E-V-E-A-D-A-M-S. Christine, if people want to talk to you about WandaVision or the fact that you're a Game of Thrones expert or anything else incredible, (laughs) where can they find and follow you? You can always find and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kippinsk, K-I-P-P-I-N-S-K. All right, legendary listeners, that is the show for today. What an epic MTVC. We'll be back down the line. Jesse Taylor and I are cooking up a new format for a special one-off show that we're going to do hopefully later this month. So stay tuned for that. If you're enjoying our show, please leave us a five-star Apple review so we can rise in those search rankings, especially between these shows. It really helps us out. And if you want to talk to me some more, you can find me at the Marvelous TV Club Facebook page, Twitter page, Instagram page, all at Marvelous TV Club. And of course, I'm on Twitter at Mark Folletti. That's Mark with a C, F as in Frank, A-L-E-T-T-I. All right, you guys, let's go try to recreate some memories, shall we? Hmm, like Ponder Vision. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. 